Hi, I'm, I'm Mark Hess. I'm with the Office of Communications. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. And uh, before we start, I thought I'd share a little anecdote. Because I wore, in, in honor of our guest this morning, I wore my little shuttle mirror shirt. I know a lot of you are, are here for the summer, uh, a lot of college interns. And so this shirt goes back to before you were born. <laughs> when there was a program called Shuttle Mirror, which is when the shuttle first docked to a Russian space station called the Mir in about the, the early 1990s. So if you want a history lesson, find me after the program and I'll share what life was like in the Plasticine era when I first uh, started working at, at NASA. So anyway, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our Deputy Center Director for Science, Dr. Colleen Hartman. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here, and it's my pleasure to welcome astronaut Mike Hopkins to Goddard here today. Um, I probably am definitely born before any of the students here, many years, and I want to say that I've been around for 33 years at NASA and watched the ISS being constructed. So talking to Mike this morning was just a pure pleasure, and he'll share amazing stories with you, and here at Goddard, we're looking forward to giving Mike more to put onto the ISS in terms of science and exploration payloads. You'll, you, you students, hopefully, will see some of that on your, uh, on your visits here for this summer. Let me tell you a little bit about Mike. He grew up in Richland, Missouri, and received his Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Illinois in 91. He was a scholar and an athlete, although he tells me that might be just a tad of a fish story. But I don't think so, because he was team captain of the UI football team, called the Fighting Alini. Did I say that right? Alina. Alina? Oh, gosh. Illini, good, because apparently Mike was the, as a junior, won the Big Ten Championship and played in the Hall of Fame Bowl. All true. So um, as a shout out to his school, his Twitter account is apparently Astro Illini. <laughs> so look him up. Mike went on to earn a Master's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from Stanford in 92. And he was ROTC all along. He joined the US Air Force and distinguished himself as a top flight test engineer. He enjoyed duty stations in Alberta, Canada, Monterey, California, my home, Parma, Italy, yay, and Washington, DC. From test pilot to special assistant to the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he then rose to the rank of colonel. So students out there, take note, ask him tons of questions about how he took this path. Um, he was selected uh, in the astronaut class in 2009. In 2013, he sat on top a rocket, a Soyuz rocket, which launched him to the ISS. And um, he was 166 days in space. He had multiple spacewalks. Um, he repaired a degraded pump module while he was on station. And he's only been walking on this, plan uh, on this planet for the last three months since that time. So um, he's got his sea legs, but apparently his frequent flyer miles were all revoked. So we're very thrilled to have him and to hear his stories about his life and the ISS. So please join me in welcoming astronaut Mike Hopkins. Thank you, Dr. Hartman. Thank you, uh, Goddard. It's, uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back on Earth. Um, it, uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. So when we're up on station, um, we spend a lot of time doing the science and, and doing a lot of maintenance. And we end up talking to a lot of people on the ground, uh, but we never get to see their face. So all we ever hear is voices. And so this is kind of special for us uh, afterwards to get to come back and, uh, and see some of the faces behind the voices. So that's uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, and so today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into kind of sharing uh, the six month on ISS experience. And so I have a video. Uh, we'll run through that video. I'll narrate it as we go. And then at the end, hopefully, we'll have plenty of time for some questions and answers. So if we could go ahead and just roll the video, and, uh, and you can see what, what I was doing from, uh, I guess, really September last year to, uh, to uh, March of this year. 
Okay, so uh, training to launch to the ISS takes about two and a half years. And what you see here is kind of the, the culmination of that, the end of that. And this is uh, exams, final exams. Um, yeah, for all you students, it never stops. Uh, you're always learning, always taking tests. And this is our final test before we launch. And so you can see behind there is the Soyuz simulator. And we're getting ready to crawl inside of that and, uh, and spend about six hours going through various procedures and emergencies. Uh, before we get to launch. Uh, my two crewmates, Oleg Kotov and Sergei Ryazansky, uh, both Russian cosmonauts, absolutely fantastic. Uh, here we see the, uh, the Soyuz rocket down in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. So we do a lot of that training you saw was uh, in Star City outside of Moscow, uh, but now at this point we're down in Kazakhstan. And uh, so we're getting ready to uh, walk out to the vehicle there. Um, it's about three in the morning. There's a lot of uh, tradition in, uh, in the Russian um, uh, system, I guess. And so we, we end up shaking a lot of hands before we finally, we finally get into the rocket. Uh, but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a great day when that finally, finally does happen. Um, just so you know, when, when you're still not quite sure at this point if you're ever gonna launch. So two and a half years, you're always, you're always kind of worried that, that it's, it's not nine, gonna happen. Eight. Um, Seven, and six, because you might get sick, five, you might get hurt or something four, like that. So three, when you're listening two, to this, one, ignition. There's, a, uh, there's a big sense of relief because now you know, okay, they can't take this away. I'm actually, I'm actually going. And the Soyuz is now um, so this on ride, a uh, pretty smooth ride actually, not too bad, but uh, it takes about nine minutes. Station. Nine minutes from, uh, from that point until we're actually up in orbit. So it's, uh, it's a pretty quick ride. You do go through uh, a little bit of G as you're going up, about four Gs or so, but not too bad. Um, there is a three stages to the rocket, um, and that's when it's kind of dynamic. When one stage stops and the next stage kicks in, you'll kind of get thrown forward and back in your seat a little bit. And you're gonna get a view here uh, soon of well, what it's like. There you can see inside the uh, Soyuz. So that's me on top, my two Russian crewmates uh, down below. But you can kind of get a sense of just how crowded uh, the Soyuz is. It's not very large, um, and, uh, but at the same time, it gets you there. Uh, so this actually is the approach to the space station. Actually, I said nine minutes to get up into space, and it's only six hours before we're docking with the space station itself. Uh, the docking is automatic. Uh, however, if anything should go wrong, um, Oleg, uh, he can uh, take control of it and we can do a manual docking. And uh, so, kind of an interesting story. So at this point right now, you know, I've been in space for maybe about five, five hours or so, six hours. And it's a, it's a pretty weird feeling your first time you're up in microgravity. For me, I actually felt like, um, like I was falling. So if everybody was to you know, hang upside down off, of, off the lights up here and, and then let go and that falling, that's how I feel at this point when I'm, when I'm docking to the International Space Station. So pretty weird feeling, um, that dream, and you never quite, uh, you never quite wake up in this case. Uh, you just keep falling and falling and falling. Um, at this point though, we've got a little more work to do. It takes about two hours before uh, you get the and pressure the equalized are open and all that. The two crews, and there you can time, see us uh, coming into the space time, station for the very first time. Eastern time. So I get asked about the, the mass, the surgical mass and all that. So Oleg and Sergey are both doctors. And uh, so they, they uh, thought it'd be a good joke to show up as the medical team. But uh, I'm actually an engineer. And uh, so you definitely don't want me. <laughs> doing any medical procedures on you, but uh, this, is a, this is one of those neat days, um, one that you, you never forget either, is uh, when you first show up on the space station. Um, and what you're going to see soon, so right after we get on board the space station, we'll go into the service module, the Russian service module, and we'll have a conference, and it's kind of neat because uh, that conference is, is with our families. So our families are actually, they've gone over to Kazakhstan as well and so they were there uh, for the launch, got to watch it live, and when we docked six hours later, that's my wife and my two sons. Yeah, you can see how thrilled they look. Dad's in space. <laughs> but uh, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's a very long, there's my, uh, actually my brother and, uh, and mom as well. It, it's a very long day for them. In fact, it's, it's a much longer day for them because you can imagine the excitement for, for me um, to be in space and everything. But, but for them, they've been up probably at that point 24 hours or so, and they, and they have a, a longer day ahead still. Um, so it, 
But I, I put that in there because I think that's a side of the story that we often don't think about, and, and that is, you know, astronauts, uh, we, we get to do an amazing job and have amazing experiments, experiences, but you, know, you can see there the advantages of microgravity, um, which is, uh, is kind of neat. But, but when we're up there, we have family members at home, people that care about us, that uh, maybe it's not as thrilling for them, it's, it's more a little uh, nerve-wracking for them as well. Um, so what you're looking out there is the, uh, the cupola. There was, there was home for the, uh, the next six months then at this point. Um, and what you're going to see next so is... I've been on station now for, what, an hour, maybe an hour and a half. So I'm going to open up uh, the windows to cupola and see what the view's like. So here. the cupola is the big window that looks uh, down at the earth. And, uh, and there it is. That's, that's my views for the next six Picture months. Get your breath away. Yep. Uh, it's, True statement. I it does take your breath away. It's something that uh, never got old. Um, seeing <laughs> seeing the Earth from that vantage uh, point is, right is truly incredible, and it's an experience that uh, I wish everybody had the opportunity to see. Um, so yeah, that's again that is the cupola there. Uh, we often get asked what a typical day is like on on station, and there's really kind of three main things that we do. Uh, while we're up on station. And one of those you're seeing now I is maintenance. Show you the box. Um, we actually have to do a lot of repair work. Come so like in. everybody's house, uh, things break, See things need to be uh, cleaned, um, et cetera. And so one of the things I'm doing right now is the, the uh, audio system. We had to change out an ABC, an audio bus coupler. And these are kind of fun days because uh, you can see we had to, you see that rack, that's how we, everything on station, we, we talk about it in terms of racks, uh, what rack is it in. And uh, it's a fun day because we actually so get to rotate this rack and, and get kind of into the guts of the station. And that's something we don't do every day, but uh, when we do get to do it, it it's a lot of fun. And you can also see kind of the advantages of, of microgravity in terms of working. Uh, things are, are very, obviously very light, so it's easy just to, uh, you know, that audio bus coupler, I don't know how much it weighs, but uh, probably, you know, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, and yet you can just very, very lightly move it around and put it in place. Um, the other thing you're going to see here in a, in a little bit, too, is the advan another advantage of microgravity in that, uh, you know, you've got this rack rotated, and you'd think it's kind of blocking uh, the, whole, the whole module out, but... Uh, You'll see uh, Rick and Koichi here. It's very easy to, to move around and to get, get out of the way of things, and, and so that's pretty good. Uh, more maintenance here, WHC. That's a fancy word for the toilet there. Um, and, and the toilet requires a lot of maintenance. Um, in fact, when, when the toilet breaks, um, everything else stops until you, until you get it fixed. So um, actually, this is just routine maintenance. That is a, uh, the fan that uh, provides the suction for the toilet and we just have to swap that out. Uh, here's um, the carbon dioxide removal assembly. These are the little valves that uh, I had to clean and stuff like that. So maintenance is one of the big things. Um, and <laughs> another thing that we have to do a lot is exercise. So what you just saw in those pictures, that doesn't work very well for staying in shape. So uh, we have three main pieces of equipment. You're seeing the, the ARAD there. That's our weightlifting equipment. And, uh, and then T2 was the treadmill that I was on. Um, on the treadmill, you can see I have to wear a harness and strap down to it to stay on it. Um, I don't normally run that fast. Um, that's the actual orientation of ARAD. So if you were looking at it in terms of an up or down, that's, that's how we lift. And in fact, that cupola is right below me there as I'm lifting. This is the uh, Cevus, that's the exercise bike. Um, so that's our third piece of equipment that we use. And we actually spend uh, two hours a day is hard scheduled for us to exercise. Uh, very, very important for us. Uh, of course, we have uh, muscle atrophy, the bone gets weaker. Uh, you can see Koichi floating through there. That's the actual WHC, that toilet is right in the midst of our gym. Um, and, and here's just some, one of the other things that we do on the side is you look out the window and, and this is the view of the earth. Um, at night and you can see just how incredible it is. You can see how thin the atmosphere looks from 260 miles up. Uh, it really gives you an appreciation for it. Uh, but what do you guys uh, do a lot here and what uh, our prime goal up there is uh, science. And so we actually had ants in space um, at one point. They came up on Orbital 1 which was launched out of uh, Wallops. Um, another thing that a lot of times we are the test subjects, the guinea pigs, and uh, we've had issues with um, uh, the eyes, eyesight, and uh, so there we're seeing a couple ways that we take images, including our own ultrasounds. Um, a lot of the experiments that we do 
We are actually the, the hands, um, the eyes, the ears for the principal investigators on the ground. And so Spheres is uh, one of those experiments. So right now you can see I've got a headset on. So I'm actually talking to the scientists on the ground as I execute this, uh, this test. And, uh, and that's a lot of fun. We get to interact, interact directly with the scientists as we're going. Um, a lot of the other ones, um, we actually enable them. So here is a combustion chamber and I'm replacing some of the hardware in it, um, some of the fuel reservoirs, some of the igniters. And basically what will happen is you're going to see I'm going to put this uh, back into the rack that it came out of. I'll close it up and then scientists on the ground, um, actually out of Marshall, will, will execute the experiments many times while we're asleep. And, um, and so that's uh, where we're, we're not executing the experiments hands on, but we're enabling. You can see Koichi going by there. As I'm, uh, as I'm finishing this up. So that uh, just gives you a sense of the various types of experiments in the astronaut involvement. Um, it really crosses a wide range of, of areas that, that we're involved in. So that's the typical day for us, maintenance, exercise, um, and science uh, with a little bit of looking out the windows. And then you have some special days, um, and these are, are very exciting days for us as well. Um, if everybody remembers back in February, uh, what happened in Sochi, uh, Russia, that was the Winter Olympics. Um, and so here you can see that's the, uh, the Olympic torch came up with us. Uh, so that was pretty unique. Normally there's six people up on station and three of them will come down before three will go back up. In this case, um, three came up because they brought the Olympic torch and it was up there for five days. Um, and then the, the three that were scheduled to come home brought it, brought it back with them. Uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, the torch was not lit. Uh, fire, fire on station is a, is a bad thing. So we, we don't tend to have open flame up there, but uh, it was still pretty special to have the, the torch there um, and to have nine, nine astronauts and cosmonauts on board. Um, again, that's, that's pretty unique for us as well. We actually did have a, uh, a relay up there, so we started in the Japanese segment, or the Japanese module over to Europe, uh, down through the U.S., and, and then back over to Russia. So that was fun. And then the other neat thing that you're going to get to see here very shortly is uh, the Russians actually took the, uh, the torch out on an EVA. And so again, that was, that was pretty special. That torch actually was the torch that was used on the final leg of the relay going into the stadium. And uh, one of the other neat things that you're gonna see with this video coming up, again, the advantages of microgravity, um, you're gonna see the, uh, the, the views of the Earth on this, on this uh, EVA, truly remarkable. Um, I guess first though, it's kind of a sense uh, what it's like to move Several around. You just barely touch the walls and you can just float, float through. It's a pretty nice way to, to get around. Um, it doesn't take much effort and uh, it, it's pretty fun. Actually, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so there you see uh, the, views, the views of the Earth and how stunning they, they truly are. Um, and what's, what also is pretty amazing about this video is it was actually taken with a GoPro camera. Um, so pretty, pretty neat to see, uh, you know, that little case that's waterproof that you can use it with is also space proof. Uh, so, but the, but the images, how, how clear it is, um, and, that's, and that's what it looks like when you're out there on a spacewalk, because uh, now all of a sudden you're not looking through all of these different layers of glass and everything, and, and there's no atmosphere up there, right, that we're, we're having to look through, so things become very, very clear. Um, so actually, if we could pause right here real quick, well, I still have the station up there. Uh, can we back up just a, just a smidge? I think there's, yeah, here we go. Can we back up just a little bit, if, if that's possible or, or not? Sorry I didn't catch it quick enough for you. Um, but on the outside of the space station, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it here, but uh, we have two cooling systems, and uh, those cooling systems uh, get rid of all of the heat from the inside. So we have a water cooling loop in the inside that then it has a heat exchanger and takes it out to an ammonia cooling loop, and there's two of them. And one of them right about here, I know it's hard to obviously tell, but uh, there's, a, there's a pump module on this side and there's a pump module on that side that controls that, that ammonia loop as it's going. Uh, we can go ahead and roll again. And that pump module had a little valve okay, guys, in it when you're that ready, had uh, failed. And so we had to, this was unplanned, and so we had to go out, uh, Rick Mastrocchio and I, on two spacewalks and repair that. Um, and uh, so pretty exciting times. Uh, 
from the time the failure happened to, to when we went out the door was about two and a half weeks, I think, way a little more than that. So it was a very busy pump time pump for us. Um, this was right spare. before Christmas. In fact, the second EVA that you're going to see is, um, is on Christmas Eve itself. So that's Rick and I outside. Yeah, Rick, we're, we're going over to get the spare pump flash, module at that point. Um, I also, again, I, I put, you're going to see some scenes here as well of uh, Rick and I, our wives. And uh, again, just to kind of highlight the fact that we're having the time of our lives out in space and, and yet our, our spouses are sitting there watching this us do this real time. Uh, that's me on the arm uh, with that pump module and uh, hanging out on the edge of the earth like that uh, was, was pretty incredible. Um, a neat experience there you can see we're putting the pump module into, um, into its place after we've, we'd already pulled out the old one at that point or the failed one and uh, the first spacewalk lasted about five and a half hours the uh, the second one was about seven and a half hours um, so these are pretty long days it takes us about five hours even to get out the door um, so by the time it's all said and done um, it's it's uh, it's a long a long day for us because then even after you come back in you still have a lot of work to do um, but but obviously um, um, there's a lot of stress that goes with it. Koichi actually was on the inside. He was the guy operating that robotic arm. Uh, did a, just a, a wonderful job, and the ground team did a fantastic job as well. And uh, so you're pretty busy while you're out there, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, you do get you do get a few times to just kind of look around and, and enjoy the view. And and sometimes we have a chance to take a few pictures as well. And I think you'll see one of those. Yeah, that's me. Um, people often say in this one that I photobombed the Earth. So. Um, all right, so moving on, another kind of special day. So this is actually real close to here. This is Wallops, and that's the uh, Orbital One uh, Cygnus vehicle that was launched. And uh, so this is how we get supplied, actually. There's two commercial uh, contractors here in the U.S. Like that supply us, uh, SpaceX and, and Orbital. And so uh, we had an Orbital vehicle come up, and there you can see it approaching the space station. So that cupola window that you that we've been uh, showing you uh, that shows the uh, great views of the Earth is also what we're using to, uh, to see the vehicles it approaches. And in fact, in there are the controls for this robotic arm. You can kind of see that, and that's what Rick is describing here. The vehicle basically comes up to about 10 meters from the station, and then it goes into formation with us. And I, will, um, I reach out with the robotic arm and grab onto it, and then at that point, um, you then berth it to the, uh, to the station itself and go through the process of opening the hatches and everything. Um, so this is kind of a, another one of those, you know, you're a little bit nervous as you're doing this, uh, a little bit intense because that's our food, that's our clothes, that's uh, new science and all that. So if you mess this up, um, it's, uh, it's going to be, um, you might go a little bit hungry. So uh, you're, you're very happy when, when that opportunity happens to, uh, to capture it and you actually get a hold of it. So it's a, it's a big relief. So there you have it. Um, and here you're going, to see, food, clothes, you're going to see the vehicle itself. Parts, there it is, birth to the station the now. And I'll actually, uh, if we can turn this up a little bit. Once Cygnus is docked, it usually takes two hours to open the hatch. But today, it's taking even longer because we're having problems getting the hatch open. Cygnus is unmanned, so there's definitely, you can turn it back down a little bit now. Um, but yeah, so there's, you know, it's kind of, there's funny moments up there like that where things don't work exactly right. Um, so that was, that was definitely one of those. Uh, but now you're looking inside uh, what it looks like when a supply vehicle comes up to us. And uh, so again, these are, uh, this is a fun time for us. Uh, you get new goodies up there, you get new science, um, you get clean clothes. Uh, so uh, that's all very good. Um, one of the other things that happens with this that's, that's special for us is usually you get a little uh, care package from, from home. And uh, so that's fun. And here you get to see us opening. That's the care package for the three of us that, uh, that our families put together. And it'll be a variety of things. You'll get cards, you'll get notes, um, maybe pictures. And sometimes, a lot of times, there's food in there. Um, yeah, food is, uh, becomes very important for you. And uh, one of the things you're going to see here uh, very soon, right there. 
Look at that. You laugh. <laughs> Those are the best tortillas. I tell you what, that was uh, that was absolutely fantastic to, to have fresh tortillas. In fact, they didn't last very long. Um, no, we went through those pretty quick. Actually, you can see too. We're in node. We're in node one here, which is where we tend to eat. Um, if anybody's from Connecticut, Rick's from Connecticut, and that's uh, a local um, hot dog relish, pepper relish that he absolutely loved. And I have to admit, I've kind of been hooked on it now too. So uh, yeah, we're gonna eat like kings. We did. We ate like kings. There you can see. That's about five minutes after we opened that up. So if you're laughing, I'm, that's a true story. Um, you can see too. Koichi's gonna let go of some food here. Um, how easy it is, you know, you can just let go, it's not going to go too far away. Um, so, it's, uh, that's, that's a good day, a very good day. Um, one of the important things about this vehicle, about the orbital vehicle, is um, it comes up, brings all of those supplies up, and we take all of that out, but then afterwards, we load it up with the trash. Uh, we generate, believe it or not, a, a lot of trash. And here you're going to see at this point the vehicle, we've fully loaded it with trash. And you're going to see the arm uh, back away from it. And then afterwards, it's going to uh, do its deorbit burn, enter the atmosphere, and burn up on atmosphere. So that's how we get rid of the trash. And again, it's, it's extremely uh, valuable and important for us uh, because, you know, like all these clothes I talk about and everything, uh, we don't have a washer and a dryer up there. So you wear it, uh, we have a, a certain rate that we get to wear it at, and, and usually you know when it's time to throw it out. Um, and then it goes in the trash, all the food packets and everything like that as we eat, uh, it goes into the trash. So you, you generate a lot, and this is a good day. The station smells a little bit better at this point. So that's fine. So, um, yeah, this is... trash will turn to vapors and a bright spectacle. Yep. Right speckle, that's right. Uh, so, um, one of the other things that I oftentimes get asked about is how do we stay in touch with, with your families and, and friends? And actually, um, we, we stay in touch quite well up there. And uh, NASA does a wonderful job of uh, giving us an opportunity. That's actually my house. Um, I, we didn't take that from space. But, uh, but you know, this just gives you a sense. Here's my wife again and the day-to-day -day activities. This was actually some video that was taken for a live show that was done with Nat Geo. And, um, but I, I highlight this because uh, you're going to see one of the ways in that we were able to keep in contact. Um, we actually have a video conference that we get to do once a week with our families. And so Julie has an iPad and it has a net meeting on it. And uh, it so happened my boys play hockey. And uh, there was a couple of times when that conference time lined up with their hockey games. And I was actually able to watch live as, uh, as my son was playing a hockey game. Um, so it's very, very special uh, for me. You can see Julie there with the, the iPad. Um, you know, the resolution was pretty good. Uh, but again, this is just, this is just one of those ways that, uh, one of those ways that we get to stay in touch with our families that, that really uh, makes the six months away from home um, you know, that much, that much easier. And if you know hockey, we were offside there. Uh, very frustrating. But, yeah, but again, that's uh, uh, pretty special. The other way we stay in touch is we have an IP phone up there, so uh, we actually go through the Teeter satellite down to Houston and get uh, put out on a normal phone network, or uh, the phone lines, I guess, at that point, and we can call anybody on their cell phone, and that happens quite a bit. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, the six months goes pretty quick. Um, I say unfortunately, but also fortunately, it's, this is those bittersweet moments. Uh, you're leaving space, um, and, and you're, you're sad to leave space. It's a, it's a great place to work. Uh, it's an amazing job to, to have the opportunity to do, but at the same time, uh, it's time to come home, be a husband, be a dad again. And, and so that's, uh, that day finally arrived. Um, so that vehicle that we came up in, the Soyuz, it's been docked the whole time uh, while we were up there as well. That's, our, uh, that's been our lifeboat. So if anything should have happened up there, either a, a, um, you know, a fire or a depress or something like that, uh, that's what we would have um, gotten home in and it's what takes us home at the end of the day. So you saw the docking, um, automatic docking that happened and here's the views of, of uh, leaving. And that's us, as seen from the station. So um, that vehicle right now, there's three parts to it. Uh, what's going to happen is there's going to be a deorbit burn about a half an hour before we enter the atmosphere. And then right before we enter that atmosphere, uh, those three pieces are going to separate. We're in the, the middle part, the descent capsule. And this is kind of a view out the window as we're entering the atmosphere at this point. So what you're seeing is the, the plasma and, and basically pieces of the, of the capsule burning off. Um, the G-loads are starting to come on at this point, and, uh, and then eventually the chute opens up, 
at 10 kilometers and, and you land in Earth. This was over in Kazakhstan again. Uh, a lot of snow that day, uh, but we felt, Thanks, felt pretty good. There's Oleg. Thanks for getting me home. Yeah, he was the commander of the, of the series, and uh, he did just a great job of, of getting us there. So, you know, at this point, the feeling is is uh, different. Uh, gravity is heavy, and you and when you haven't been in it for a while, um, you definitely notice it. And uh, but at the same, so right there is actually interesting. You saw me kind of just having to lean over to get out the heli the hatch of the helicopter. Um, at that point, my vestibular system is, is all messed up, and I actually felt like I was just going to fall straight over on my face. Um, it wasn't much of a movement, but it was enough to, to make it feel like that, um, and even leaning over to get into, into the vehicle there. Um, so at that point, uh, we're still over in Kazakhstan, uh, but very quickly we, uh, we get on to an airplane that brings us right back to Houston. So within 24 hours of, of landing in Kazakhstan, I was uh, home in, in Houston. So. Again, NASA does a, a great job of taking care of us and, and getting us home. Um, at that point, we go into a post-flight phase, and that lasts about six months. The first couple of months are dedicated to rehabilitation, a lot of medical uh, exams, medical tests, experiments, because we are the guinea pigs, so they want to get as much data as they can uh, before we've readapted to 1G. We do a lot of debriefs. And then we kind of go into a four-month uh, public relations phase where we get to share the story. And that's where I am right now, and that's what I'm getting to do right now. And, and it's, a, it's a great story to share. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to talk about. Um, it, it's, it's great to see the videos, uh, believe it or not. You know, it's been three months, um, and, and unfortunately, you quickly forget what it's like to float. And so it's nice to see the videos to kind of remind, remind us of, of what that is like. So. Um, that's six months on station, and that's pretty similar to what you're going to find for, for most everybody uh, that, that goes up now. And so at this point, I would be uh, happy to take any questions that, that you may have. Hello. So I have a question about your schedule. What happens when you get sick? How does your schedule change? Okay. What happens when we get sick? Uh, so we try to avoid that. One of the ways we try to avoid that is actually we go into a quarantine period before launch. And so I guess probably about 10 days before we do launch, um, we're somewhat isolated. You know, we still have to, to be around people and everything, but everybody that, that has contact with us uh, has to go through medical exams and all that to make sure no one is sick. Um, and so that's one way we avoid getting sick. Uh, second, though, on orbit, we do have quite a bit of medical uh, uh, capabilities. So we actually have all kinds of meds. We have defibrillator up there if we should get to that point, um, and, uh, you know, the EpiPens and, and everything that, that might be needed if there was any kind of emergency. Um, and at the same time, we also have uh, flight docs that are on the ground. Uh, we actually have a conference with them once a week. It's a private conference that we're able to, to share any, any issues that we may be having, and then they could prescribe anything that, that might help us out with that. Um, so in general, uh, there's not a lot of colds or flus or anything like that that go around up there, uh, because again, if you, if you took that up there, then pretty much everybody's gonna get it with, uh, with the way we have to recircle the air, recirculate the air and everything. Um, but again, we've got the flight docks and the, the equipment on board if, if we had to, to, to get better. Come to the microphone stands to ask your questions. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little about uh, orienting yourself uh, in microgravity. Like yeah. do, do you get uh, a little confused wondering where up is? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a great question, and you're absolutely right. So I mentioned when I when I first got into space, I had that feeling of falling, and that lasted probably for about 18 to 24 hours. Uh, in six hours, though, you know, we docked with the station, we go on board the station. And uh, of course, there's no up and down, but I felt like the whole station was flying left wing low. You know, I don't, I don't know why, but uh, that was just the sense that, that I had. Um, that went away probably in about 24 hours or so. But again, you still want to, you know, we're, we're definitely rooted in 1G, and, and so everything you want to do up there, you think in that fashion. And the laboratory or all the, the modules, we kind of talk about a deck, a port, starboard, and an overhead. Um, of course, the advantage is we've got equipment in, in all of those locations, um, and there's a point when you first start up, get up there, you know, you'll typically work at a rack where you'll have your feet pointing down at the deck and you'll do everything in that orientation, but then something happens along the way that you'll be working on something and you'll kind of just get yourself in an orientation 
um, to do the job right, and, and then you'll kind of look around and realize, oh, I'm standing on the ceiling. Um, so your mind, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Your mind starts to adapt to it, um, to where you don't think about it. That, for me, probably was about in the, in the two-week point where that, you know, you stop noticing up or down. And it's, it's really cool because I remember when I, when I first got there, um, I was in Node 3 with Karen and Luca, and we're, and we're having a conversation. And, you know, Karen's upside down and Luca's, Luca's uh, sideways to you, and I'm just sitting there going, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> but then eventually that goes away too, and you'll, you'll be in those kind of orientations, having conversations, and it's, it's just normal. And it's pretty amazing how that happens. So the mind does eventually accept the fact that there's no up or down. Yeah. Hello. Did you ever get sick, like from the quick transition going up to this station? Okay, so and transitions, going down? yeah, the transitions can be, uh, they can be very uh, provocative, no doubt about that. Um, I did not get sick. Uh, however, I also, um, I did take medications uh, before launch, and and then I also took uh, medications before landing, that uh, most likely helped me out a little bit as well. Um, again, I had all of that, you know, I, I felt weird, the vestibular system was all messed up, but I didn't have any nausea or anything like that. Um, and it's different for everybody, and that's what's uh, it's kind of weird about it, is you just don't really know how you're going to react to it until, until you actually go. Yes, sir? It's like a four-part question on one topic. Okay. Uh, how much sleep did you get, uh -huh. and did you sleep similar to the sleep patterns you have on Earth, mm -hmm. and well, how are your dreams, yeah. and do you okay. still dream about space? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so the sleeping. So we have a crew quarter on board. That's kind of our private space. It's about the size of a broom closet. Uh, again, because there is no up or down or anything like that, uh, you just we took a sleeping bag, you strap it to a wall, and, uh, and you crawl inside it at night and sleep. Uh, we're actually on GMT time, and uh, that's just that's where we're on. Of course, we're going around the Earth 16 times a day. Um, so a lot of sunrises and sunsets, but we don't really see it that much because you'd have to be at the cupola uh, looking out to really notice that. So, you know, from a night time or getting adjusted to the time, you just at, at night, 10, 11 o'clock, you turn out the lights, um, and in the morning you, you wake up and turn on the lights. And so um, from a circadian rhythm standpoint and all of that, you get adjusted just like uh, traveling anywhere, you know, going over to Europe or, or Russia or anything like that. Uh, sleeping was pretty comfortable up there. Um, I. I certainly got, I got about the same as what I get on the ground, five to six hours is what I tend to sleep, and that was, that was more than adequate up there. Again, it was, it was pretty comfortable. It's interesting, though, there was one thing, um, you know, when you have a, a, a busy day and maybe you've done a lot of exercise or something, you're kind of tired, your legs are tired, everything like that, and, you, and when it's time to go to bed, you lay down on the bed, and there's just that sense of relaxation, right? And you don't get that in space because you're always off your feet, you know, you're always, uh, and so that's certainly one thing I noticed just from a mental standpoint of, uh, of you know, what a little bit different. In terms of dreams, yeah, I dreamed up there. Did I dream about space? I'm not quite sure. I'm not one of those that remembers my dreams very well. Um, so I don't know if there was anything really special with them. I certainly dream even when I'm awake now about being back up there, though. Yes, sir. Um, what food did you miss the most? So uh, fresh produce. The, the fresh apples, the bananas, the oranges, those kind of things, fresh vegetables. You know, everything that we're eating is um, most of it's radiated type food, uh, dehydrated type food, or you do get a few um, normal things like granola bars and, and stuff like that. But fresh produce, sometimes when these visiting vehicles come up, if they had enough space, they'd slip in a few apples or something like that for you. And that, again, was, was kind of special for us. But that was, that was really what I missed the most. I had a second question. Yeah, you um, bet. What would you say needed the most improvement um, any, in any field? Um. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because part of what I did, I mentioned uh, in that first two months, we do a lot of debriefs, and that's exactly what they're trying to find out is are there things that we need to prove on and all of that. Um, in general, I would say that life on station is, is very, very good, um, and there's not a lot, uh, there's always improvements that can be made, but in general I'd say everything is pretty good. Uh, the operations up there at a, at a great state, um, the things like the food and the clothes, uh, the communications with your families, the communications that are organized right here at, at Goddard um, through the Teeter satellites, that's all very good. In fact, right now we have four space to ground links, so we're able to, all four or all three of us in the U.S. segment at any one time can all be on a separate loop talking to scientists, talking to the maintenance guys, 
Um, the procedures that we use are all extremely good as well. Um, so at this point, I'd, I'd say, you know, I don't, anything that I would have a recommendation for would be very, very minor. And, and so, not, you know, not a lot of differences are needed. Let's see, where do we want to go? We'll start here. Hi, I had a question about the failed pump modules yeah. that you fixed. Did you discard them in the Cygnus? Were they too big to fit? Now? Yeah, How they're too big. Them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in fact, what it high, one of the things it highlights is, uh, so the shuttle, you know, it retired uh, just a few years ago, and the shuttle was the only vehicle we had that could bring up some of the things like the pump module. And so what they did um, is, before the shuttle retired, they brought up as many supplies or, or uh, parts and pieces that they thought they might need that were very large like that. Um, so that, that failed one is actually still on the outside of the space station. It's hooked up to the mobile cart there on the POA. And in fact, in a future EVA, they're going to have to take that and put it back uh, where we got the, the new one from. Um, so yeah, it's, it's too big to bring inside. It's too big to go into one of the vehicles. Uh, there's a possibility that um, it could just be discarded, uh, which would be kind of a fun day if you're out there for that. Um, but uh, it's, not, it's not clear at this point. I think most likely it's though it's going to get stored and it's just going to be there until the station's done. Yeah. What's the most interesting part about doing a spacewalk? What's the most interesting what about a spacewalk? Uh, what's the most interesting part? Like, what oh, did you part find? of the spacewalk, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, pretty easy for me. Um, well, the two things. I'll, I'll describe two things that were pretty interesting about it. The first is when you, when you first open up that hatch and you look out at, uh, at the Earth in the vacuum of space and you're going, holy smokes, well, you know, that's that, what am I doing? How, how did I get to this point? Um, so it's definitely going through your mind. Um, but if you remember seeing me on, on that robotic arm when I had a hold of that pump module, so um, in the suit, you know, it's a pretty tight fit, but you still have a little bit of room, so you still kind of float in the suit. So when you're on that robotic arm or on a plate, and it's got a couple of toe loops that you, you stick your toes through, and then your heels are kind of clipped in, and, and uh, I've, you know, you, you've got my, my toes are curled over, and my heels are really pressing down hard because, you, you know, you want to make sure you stay on this thing. Well, that 800-pound um, pump module, it's got mass, right? And so even though it doesn't weigh anything, um, it's still, once it gets going in a direction, it wants to keep going. And um, at one point that, you know, I'm on the arm, it's moving, and it comes to a stop, well, that pump module wants to, to keep going. And it actually kind of pulled me up a little bit in my, in my suit, and so there was that momentary feeling of, oh my gosh, I just came off of the, of the robotic arm, and I'm getting ready to float away into space with this pump module. I mean, it, la it, it lasted two or three seconds. Um, it's funny, as it, it happened the first time, kind of caught me by surprise, catches your breath, and think, okay, I'm still here, everything's good. Um, and then we had another maneuver, and I knew it was coming, and I had the same exact feeling uh, when the arm stopped again. So that definitely surprised me a little bit. Yeah. Hi. Um, you hear astronauts sometimes speak about the first time they see the Earth from space. They speak about um, feeling a sense of unity yeah. of the Earth. Is yeah. that something that you yourself experience? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, you see the Earth from that vantage point, and, you know, you don't see borders. Um, you see this very thin atmosphere that uh, protects us. Uh, so it certainly gives you a, a new appreciation for the Earth. One of the other things I would say about uh, being up there and seeing it, there, there are, I'd never found a part of the Earth that I didn't find amazing, beautiful to see from, from space, including things that you, know, you probably wouldn't even think would be, uh, would be neat to see, like deserts, right? I mean, that's just a bunch of sand. But then when you see it from 260 miles, you get this perspective of these sand dunes that have been shaped by the wind, and there's these amazing geometric patterns that just stretch for, for hundreds of miles, and, and it's it, it, truly incredible. So absolutely, uh, you, you have that sense. Uh, it gives you a, a greater appreciation of the Earth that we live on, you bet. Yeah. What did your crew members do, the doctors? Were they just medical officers? Oh, no. So everybody, all of the astronauts on board the space station are generically trained, if you will. So even though we come from a wide variety of backgrounds, you know, doctors, uh, I'm a uh, flight test engineer from the Air Force, um, we've got pilots, we've got scientists, we've got, uh, you know, there's geologists or teachers. So astronauts come from a wide variety, but in, for the space station operations, we're all trained very generically. So we all have to be able to go out on that spacewalk. You know, Koichi was in on the robotic arm, but he could have been out the door as well. Um, we all have to be able to operate the robotic arm. We all have to be able to, to operate the science experiments. Um, there's some differences between which ones we're test subjects for, um, but in general, we're, we're very generic in our training. 
So why would they send doctors to space? Uh, well, the, again, they have a lot of experience. You know, flight docs are, are uh, a part of, of all the military services as well for the flying community. Um, so they have a lot of special knowledge about uh, what's happening with the body in these kind of environments. And so uh, it's just an experience base that uh, is, is beneficial for, for being an astronaut. And, um, and yeah, again, that's just, uh, you know, it's a skill that's, that's useful. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your time. Yeah, you bet. Uh, two quick questions. Do you have any mementos from space? And mementos. you mentioned the smell. Yeah, I okay, know. you've heard that one. <laughs> okay, um, so mementos from space. Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate in that we do get to take a few things up with us. Um, and of course, every, every ounce, every pound counts. And so uh, again, we're lucky that we do get to take things up. Um, I took a few a few things up with me. Um, I've got some very good friend, a very good friend who is a World War II vet, and I took up a Purple Heart for him. Uh, my father was a Marine, a pilot in the Marines, and I took up his logbook and uh, and logged the flight in that. Um, so you know, um, a few a few things like that I, I did take up, and then smell. Um, and when he mentions smell, I'm not in that case talking about what it smells like inside the station. Um, so it, when, when that vehicle, like the orbital you saw, when it docked and, um, you know, initially that, that space in between the two hatches, that vestibule area is at the vacuum of space. And then, of course, we equalize the pressure in it before we open the hatch. And so when we first open that hatch from the station, um, there is a very distinct smell. And uh, when, when I opened the hatch uh, for the orbital demo vehicle, Karen and Luca were there with me. and. And I, you know, I kind of mentioned. I said, "Yeah, that's the smell of space." And and I don't, I don't know. You know, I try and describe it as kind of metallic or an ionization type smell. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it smells like space. Uh, clearly, it's not. <laughs> it's not what space. You know, it has something to do with the vehicles and and all of that. But it, it you know, it started with that vacuum, and and then uh, it's very noticeable. And it happens when you go out in the spacewalk. You come back in uh, the same kind of thing. So it's very unique, and uh, um, I wish I had a better way to describe it. It's kind of like, you know, what's it taste like? It tastes like chicken. It smells like space. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, how did being in zero gravity affect the, like, the circumstances and the results of a lot of the science that you were doing up there? Well, a lot of the science uh, that we do up there is, is specifically taking advantage of, of the microgravity environment. Um, so there's certain things that are beneficial, uh, uh, protein growth. Um, is, is unique in the, in the microgravity environment, and so it allows scientists to learn things uh, about these proteins that they can't find out on the ground. Uh, from the human body standpoint, you know, our, our, our bodies react to microgravity in, in strange ways as well. Uh, many times it speeds up processes that happen to us here on the ground um, as we get older. So, for example, our immune systems um, <clears throat> there's, there's problems with, in fact, this is out of NIH over uh, just on uh, the other side of D.C. Uh, the T cells are what kind of activate your immune system when something's detected. And in space, there's problems with those T cells. Um, it, it gets suppressed. Well, the same thing happens as we get older. Uh, so what one of the other things that space then gives us is this environment um, where in a much quicker time frame we can start to see um, not only what's happening to us, but then maybe countermeasures that potentially then could be beneficial for life here on Earth, where it takes much longer to see these same kind of results. But uh, maybe we can find find ways to counter them uh, up in space. Yes, hey, Mike. Let, uh, if I could just jump in real quick. Oh yeah, Mark. Sure. We've got some remote sites that I just want to check in with and see Sorry. if uh, any of our friends at uh, Wallops have any questions. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering how, how the preparation process of our astronauts has changed since the first shuttle went up. Um, he would mentioned that he'd been quarantined and that they gave him special medications so that he wouldn't get sick. Have they always done that? Yeah, that's actually a, a, great, a great question. And um, when I was reading about that T-cell experiment that uh, I mentioned, um, there was some background data on it. And it actually talked about in the early days of the Apollo program that they didn't actually quarantine them. Um, and yet they were seeing a high rate of people being sick when they first got up on, on uh, or in space. And so I think um, there was somewhere in there that they actually started the process of quarantining 
uh, the astronauts before they launched. Uh, and then, of course, I think that transitioned through into the shuttle days. I know they did that. They did it uh, both at JSC and then when they got to KSC, the shuttles were, were uh, the astronauts were quarantined. Um, so that's been a process that's been around. The medication part, I would say, is very astronaut unique, very individual. Um, and so a lot of times we'll try out these medications beforehand because, of course, one of the things you, you want to make sure is that this medication isn't going to make you sleepy or something like that because if you're, if you're uh, flying a vehicle into space, you don't want to be drowsy. Um, so, and, that, and that impact is different for every astronaut as well. So there's, there's astronauts to this day that, that don't do uh, medications when they launch, um, but in, in my case, it, it worked out well, and I, I think it was helpful. Yes, can we, can we jump over here? She's been uh, waiting for a little bit. Yep, and then we'll go. Okay. Hi, thank you. You bet. Uh, I was just curious if there were ever any personal conflicts between any of the astronauts. It's a great question. <laughs> personal <laughs> conflict. Um, yeah, because you're in some pretty tight quarters up there for six months. Um, but uh, fortunately, um, we all got along very, very well. Another thing is the space station is quite large. Uh, believe it or not, it, you know, on the outside, it's about the size of a football field. On the inside, you know, we talk about a, the volume of a 747. So you can actually go quite a long time without seeing your crewmates if you so desire, um, if things are getting a little rough for you. But that actually goes into part of the, the process uh, for selecting the astronauts now, too. And that is how well do you get along with people. And that's probably one of the more important criteria that they look at. And so if, um, you know, if, you're, if you had trouble making friends and getting along with people not only up there but also on the ground, uh, you might find it harder to, to get selected as an astronaut someday. So it's, it's very important for us. Do you want to go back? Uh, yeah, let's see. Any, were there any other questions from Wallops? No, I can't see it over there. No, don't. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, we live in a society that you know, upholds privacy to a high regard. Um, how do you deal with living in such a long period of time uh, without with a lack of privacy. Yeah, that's <laughs> you. You definitely are living in a fishbowl. Uh, there's there's no doubt about it. Um, it's it's something that you you do get used to. On the other hand, one of the things we we will do uh, the cameras are are typically on on the space station um, from the time we have a morning daily planning conference that's anywhere from seven to seven thirty, and then uh, at the end of the day we have another one at seven thirty eight o'clock at night. So in general, the cameras that you'll see on in the modules, those are on during that period of time. And then once, uh, once we've done with the evening DPC, they typically shut off the, the downlink for that uh, so that we can have a little bit of privacy. Um, I also mentioned the, uh, the crew quarters that we have up there. Uh, believe it or not, I mean, it's small, but, but it is kind of your own little space. And, uh, and so you can get some privacy there. Um, the same thing with our IP phone calls and all of that. Those are private phone calls, so it's typically not bu it's not business work, um, and so you're able to to have some some private time that in that way as well. So you get used to it uh, a little bit, but it is nice uh, once in a while to shut off the cameras as well. Yes, ma'am. One, one more question. Oh, um, we'll, we'll come right back to you here in a sec. Did you um, felt hot when you entered the atmosphere? Yeah, that's a great question. Do we feel hot when we enter the atmosphere? It's kind of interesting. So the sun rises. On the, on the space station can be very dramatic because um, uh, you're traveling so fast, 17,500 miles an hour, and you'll kind of see this blue, um, this blue glow on the horizon, and then and it'll kind of get orange, and then all of a sudden, boom, the sun comes up and, and just this very bright orange light. Um, on the landing, um, as we are entering the atmosphere, we, you know, we're in the, in the shadow, and I'm sitting in the capsule, and we've got a couple windows that are one on the right and left that are kind of behind you a little bit. And I'm sitting there and I see kind of this, uh, you know, things are getting bright inside. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, we, the sun must have just come up. And then I, I turned around and looked and that scene you saw earlier, and that's when I realized, oh, no, we're burning up in the atmosphere. And that's the, that's the orange glow of this uh, hot plasma and, and the um, pieces of the, of the capsule burning off. Um, it did get a little bit warmer at that point. Uh, probably more noticeable for us was the G loads are starting to come on. And so we actually got up to about five Gs during that landing. It's coming down through your chest, so it's not like in an airplane, um, but uh, where it's coming down through your head, which can pull the blood down, and you can get that, that blacking out. But it did get harder to breathe and everything. But you know, you're, you're pretty warm already in those spacesuits as well. Um, so uh, you know, it wasn't as noticeable as some of the other things that are happening at that point in time. Shall we go back to Wallach real quick? I think he had a second question, or? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh 
two quick questions. You speak of uh, tight quarters, so just wondering if you can give us an idea of square footage of the area that you were actually staying in at the space station. And second is, was there any language barrier between you and the other uh, astronauts? Okay. Yeah, the actual uh, square footage or cubic uh, footage of the volume space, I'm, I'm not quite sure. So for everybody, I know it's a pretty young crowd here, but I think, I think uh, um, you know, for the older crowd, you know what a phone booth is like. That's about the space of our, of our private space that we had. Uh, in general, again, we'll oftentimes describe the inside volume as a four or five bedroom house um, or a, uh, a 747 on the internal volume. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I forgot real quick, the, the second question, what was that? Language again? barrier. Language barrier, yeah. Um, so we have to learn Russian, and uh, that was probably the hardest part of my training, was learning Russian. Uh, yeah. uh, so, of course, you saw us launching on the Soyuz rocket, landing on the Soyuz rocket, and, and that's all in Russian. Um, on the station itself, uh, English is primarily spoken, but Russian is spoken as well. And so the Russians do learn English. So it's, it's uh, back and forth. Um, the language barrier, um, I would say in general, uh, there's typically a mix of skills in the language. And the, if there's a language barrier, you tend, to, you tend to gravitate towards where the stronger skills are. So in my case, like Oleg and Sergei, though we did everything on the launch and landings were in Russian, their English was very strong. In fact, Sergei um, studied over here. He worked over here. Oleg spent. Uh, many years over here, he, at one point he was going to fly on the shuttle. Uh, so their English was very strong. So if there was anything that actually became critical in an emergency situation and it looked like I was confused uh, with the Russian language, they would just very quickly uh, pop into English. Uh, but there's other crews where that mix may go the other way, where uh, one of the U.S. astronauts may have a, a, a little bit better grasp on the Russian language than the Russian has on the English. So it really depends on the crews. But we didn't have any problems whatsoever. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Carl Hilly with the uh, Office Hi, of Communications. We've been taking questions from social media for this event okay. uh, through the hashtag Ask NASA. So uh, the most common question was, can you take me up there with you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I tell you, I, I, wish, I wish everybody got to experience uh, being in space because it, it truly is an incredible experience. It's an amazing experience. And, and hopefully, you know, as we, you know, as this commercial crew and things like that, we're going to start seeing more and more opportunities, uh, you know, maybe not in the near future, but in the, in, in the not too distant future, maybe we'll see more opportunities for all of us to go up. Maybe the second most common was, how can I get a, a replica of that snazzy U.S. flag flight jacket? That, oh, that flight jacket? Well, unfortunately, you have to get picked for, <laughs> for being an astronaut because uh, that was issued to me. <laughs> but on a more serious note, there's, um, I believe we've just started an experiment to grow food on the station. Yeah. Um, so I have a question from uh, Chris D. Marshall on Twitter. Uh -huh. He wants to know, would you go back and uh, what would you think about eating food grown on the space station? Yeah, it's a great, uh, both great questions. Uh, yeah, I would go back. Um, you know, I was, I was, it was time for me to come home, but at the same time, uh, I would certainly go back. It's easy for me to say I'd go back right away uh, because I know it's not very, li it, it's not likely uh, because as the, as the guy that just returned, I'm at the back of the list, uh, the back of the line. Uh, but that's understandable. In terms of the food, I would absolutely uh, feel very comfortable uh, eating food that was, was grown up there on the space station. In fact, I actually, just on my own, I took up a few seeds with me and, and uh, tried to grow some of those. I had a, a pumpkin seeds. I had uh, sunflower seeds. And it's, it was pretty amazing. You know, very easy to germinate them, get them to, to start growing. Uh, but uh, I didn't have quite the right light and the, quite the right food. So typically about six weeks after they were, they were growing. And I got, you know, some of them about that high before they uh, passed away. Um, <laughs> so I never got anywhere close. I think I saw some pictures of uh, Steve Swanson up there with some of the, I think, lettuce that was growing, and it looked like actually it was you know, big enough to, to be able to eat. So I think that's, that's going to be great when that happens, uh, when we're doing that on a regular basis. And I think if we go to Mars, um, I think that's one of the things that will help uh, with, that, with that mission. Can we jump over here real quick and get a question? Yeah. Yeah, um, how was and how much was your training before the expedition? Yeah, the training is uh, it's pretty extensive. So I got selected in, in 2009 as an astronaut, and you go into a candidate phase where you spend two years of kind of what we'll call basic astronaut training. Um, that involves everything from um, the ISS systems, from how to, you know, the, the uh, suit, the space suit, the robotic arm, um, but it also involves the Russian language. 
At that point, um, I was very fortunate and got selected for a mission, and that's a two and a half year training flow. Uh, during that two and a half years of training, we, I spent, or uh, you can spend anywhere from 35 to 52 weeks in Russia, um, up in Star City going through training, uh, probably six weeks in Japan, six weeks in Europe, um, a couple weeks in Canada, and then uh, the rest of the time down in Houston. So we travel a lot um, all over the world uh, during that two and a half years, and the, again, the training is, it is very extensive. We have a lot of, you know, all the systems on board, we have to take these masteries on them. Um, uh, and, you know, same kind of thing. We've got exams on that we have to pass on the robotic arm, on the suits and all of that before we're, we're cleared for flight. And was there something you did not expect from the space station? Something I didn't expect from the station. Uh, yeah, I'll say a couple things. Uh, one was that smell that I talked about that was just something I'd never heard heard before, I don't know, Tom, have you ever heard about the smell of space before? Yeah, I'd never, I don't know why, no one ever talked about it, but uh, it was definitely unique. Um, and then the floating, I would say, was unique for me. It was, it was just something that you, you know, you can, you can dream about it down here on Earth, uh, but until you get up there and get to really experience it for a long period of time, you don't know what it's going to be like. And it takes a while to get used to. Uh, the first couple of weeks up there were, were interesting for me because, uh, uh, you know, you don't quite know how hard to push off. You don't, you know, you, you don't quite know um, how to redirect yourself as you're going through a module. And so I, I don't know how many times I cracked my head on the hatches as I was flying through. Uh, so it took a little while to get used to that. And then, you know, I'd say you just don't know what the Earth looks like. You see pictures, but until you really experience seeing it from 260 miles up, just amazing, absolutely incredible. Should we go back to social media? Yeah, yeah I think um, they're telling me this is going to be our last question for time. But, okay, um, maybe, we'll get, maybe we'll get uh, one more over here, too, that's standing up. So let's do the social media one, then we'll do him, and, and maybe we'll okay. wrap it up there. Um, Mortimer Zilch asks, um, did you ever experience space euphoria or see S someone being treated for, for it? For 166 days, I was in euphoria, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't know what space euphoria really is, but, uh, you know, I, was, I, uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, every minute that I was up there. And uh, it, was, it was a privilege to be able to, um, to, to, to be on the space station, to do the, the work, um, to, to represent this nation, to represent NASA. You know, that, that really is, is much bigger than any one person's dream. And, and so it was, you know, again, for me, it was quite an honor to get to do that. And at the same time, you're just loving every minute that you're doing it. So how, how good is that? Uh, yeah, we'll go one more, one more question then. Yeah, I just have a question about hair growth. Does hair it growth. grow faster, slower? Or did you have a barber yeah. on the ISS? Yeah, so, so it grows. Yeah, your hair grows up there. Um, and so we end up cutting each other's hair while we're on orbit. Um, so I have a funny story to tell on that. So if you're familiar with the, how the clippers work, uh, you know, maybe the, the women on the, in the crowd aren't as familiar, but for the guys, you know, we have the, the numbering system on the clippers and the guards, right? So you start out with a one, that's, that's pretty close, and then two gets a little longer, three, and then four is a little longer. So I like, I like to kind of have mine um, in that gradual. So I, I was, Kuichi was cutting my hair uh, the first time, and, and uh, so I said, okay, I want one that kind of goes up to the ear, and then a little bit higher, two, then three, and then four across the top. And Kuichi said, all right, got it. And uh, so, so he starts out, we go one, and he goes two, and then he goes three, and then he goes two. <laughs> so, so at that point, we had to, we had to adjust, and, uh, and we went two all over and, and cleaned it up that way. So um, you know, we don't have the most skill up there as, as barbers, uh, but it has to get done because, yeah, your hair, your hair does grow. It grows probably about the normal. I didn't notice a, a big difference. Uh, every couple of weeks, I was probably trying to clean my hair up a little bit. But that one, I had a few extra weeks to, to grow back. So I, I guess that, is that it, Mark? That's yeah, all we have time for? Yeah, and let's give Mike a, a big hand of applause. Right. So I, I think, although we'll let, we'll let uh, everybody else decide, but Mike might have time for pictures. Oh. We're going to ask everybody, please, no autographs, because he, he does have a hard cutout today. But... It, he, he can stay maybe for a few minutes for some pictures. And, and Mark, if you would come up here real quick. Um, I apologize, I almost forgot about this, and I guess uh, Dr. Hartman left, but uh, I, I do have something for Goddard uh, that uh, is, uh, is a minimal from, from the expedition on orbit. So this is uh, a montage. Uh, it actually has the, the mission patch on it that has the name of, of all us on there. You see all of the crews, and then it kind of has just some pictures that highlight some of the major events that, uh, that took place on board, including... Uh, 
the spacewalks and the orbital vehicle launched right out of Wallops again. So all you guys in Wallops, thank you. And uh, some of the science and everything. So again, um, thank you. You bet. Good. Wonderful. And, and I guess kind of in closing, I, you know, I, I, I wish I had more time. I wish I could answer all of your questions. Um, I could spend all day talking about it. It, it really is that uh, incredible of an adventure, and it's, it's fun to share. It's fun to talk about. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, I, I would encourage you. I, I'm, I see a lot of young faces out there. My guess is there's a few of you that uh, have interest in doing this job, and I highly encourage that. And if I could just say a few words on that, don't ever, ever, ever give up if it's what you want to do. Find something you love. Do it. Do it very well, but keep applying. Um, it took me uh, 13 years, four applications before I was selected. So I have three rejection letters from NASA. Um, so so uh, if you're interested in it, it's definitely worth it. It's worth the wait. Um, and, and so never give up, and good luck. Thanks. <laughs>